Good morning, everyone. My name is Tina, and I'm the worship producer here at Purpose Church. Whether you've been worshiping with us for a while or just checking our church for the first time, I'm so glad that you have joined our online community today. There's something at our church for children, young adults, grandparents, and everyone in between. So follow our social media, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and check out our website to connect with God, connect with others, and connect others with God. We'll continue our preaching series today, Jesus on Every Page, jumping into the New Testament with the book of Matthew. But before that, let me tell you a little bit about what's going on at Purpose Church. Team Night is coming in 10 days. Well, on Wednesday, August 30th at 5.30 p.m., every regular volunteer from every ministry at Purpose Church will rally together to enjoy food, fellowship, worship, training, and get encouragement from Pastor Glenn. The deadline to sign up for Team Night is today, so go to purposechurch.com slash serve to register. Speaking of serving, let me invite you to join me in using your artistic gifts to further God's kingdom through the worship arts ministry. Singers of all ages, from children to adults, instrumentalists, artists, thespians, and production crew members are welcome to be a part of this team. So just email music at purposechurch.com for more information on how to get involved. For all the men out there, it's time for another one of our legendary monthly warrior breakfast. Brace yourself in an extraordinary morning filled with purposeful worship, inspiring message, brotherly bonding in Christ, and a free breakfast. There's no need to register, just show up for a good time on Saturday, August 26th from 8 to 10 a.m. in the B building. And the fun doesn't end with breakfast. The annual Warrior Men's Event is coming up on Saturday, September 30th. It is the perfect time to invite your friends, especially those that do not have a church home, to experience life at Purpose Church. And for the ladies, we have a community for you as well. Journey through the book of Acts in our upcoming women's Bible study, Believing Jesus. Explore how the gospel transformed the lives of believers and shaped the culture. Online and in-person groups are available, so take advantage of this fantastic opportunity to strengthen your faith, connect with other women, and gain valuable insights from the book of Acts. Go to purposechurch.com women for more information, and I can't wait to see you there. There are many other ways you can partner with Purpose Church to further God's kingdom. To find these opportunity or to give online, go to purposechurch.com slash give. And if you would like to support the fire relief efforts in Maui, you can do so by giving to our Global Missions Fund. Be sure to mark your gift with the memo Maui Fire. And as we continue to worship together, let's pray. Father God, I just want to especially pray for the people in Maui today. We know that you're close to the brokenhearted, so please be with them. Those who have lost homes, those who have lost loved ones, we know that you care about them and know what they're going through. And in addition, I also want to ask you to come into our lives right now, fill us with your spirit so that we can worship you today in spirit and in truth. Help us to listen to your word and to learn what you would like for us to learn in the book of Matthew. In Jesus' name, amen. devoted like a ring of solid gold like a vow that is tested like a covenant of old your love is enduring through the winter rain and beyond the horizon with mercy for today and faithful you have been
great to see you, Purpose Church. So good to be together here uh, online. Uh, before we get into our study, uh, I would like to highlight the summer preaching ministry of our associate lead pastor, Eric Holmstrom, because I think you'll be encouraged and inspired as I was. Uh, in July, the month of July, Pastor Eric preached 26 times in 30 days to over 3,000 people, including 1,700 students, and 400 of those students made decisions to follow Jesus. And I would like you just to see a recap of those events. Let's watch Following this. Following God is what you were created for, and it is the life that you were designed to live. And it is the only way through the gospel, the good news, the death and resurrection of Jesus. It is the only way to be right with God. It is the only way to be forgiven and to feel that freedom. And it is the only way to spend all of eternity with your creator. I want to tell you about the God who rescues and saves, not just from lion's den, but rescues and saves us for now and all of eternity. I want to tell you about the God who did everything that you could never do on your own to rescue you and save you because he loves you more than you could ever fully understand that Jesus Christ died on the cross 2,000 years ago. Because what Jesus did is he lived a perfect, sinless life and became the perfect sacrifice. That, that, that what Jesus decided to do is to take your sin and my sin, to say, I will die the death of sin so that you could be free, so that you could be forgiven. That Jesus took the weight of the sin of the world on his shoulders and defeated sin and death. This is an unbelievable exchange. The Bible says if you will confess your sins to Jesus, if you will acknowledge your need for Jesus, if you will admit that you're a sinner and that you need his forgiveness and his grace, if you will bring the worst of yourself to Jesus, he will give you the best of himself. helped make that happen through your prayers and financial support. And I am so grateful uh, to you as we praise God together for what he did this summer. Now today we're continuing our 2023 series, which we're studying the 66 books of the Bible in 52 weeks. The title of our series is Jesus on Every Page. And today we move into the New Testament. Finished up the Old Testament last Sunday. Today we begin the New Testament. So our first series within a series is the Jesus Movement. The Jesus Movement. The title for today's study is Matthew, Jesus, Our Promised King. Now, you've heard the excuse of a student to their teacher, my dog ate my homework. Well, I almost had that excuse this morning uh, that my dog ate my sermon. Uh, our dog Hazel got a hold of my um, Matthew uh, sermon folder, and, and there's Floyd and Hazel, and, and they were accusing each other. Hazel said Floyd did it, and, and Floyd said Hazel did it, but Hazel's the one we determined did do it. And she chewed my Matthew sermon folder, chewed it into pieces, but fortunately she didn't chew uh, the essential parts. So, but we, we pinned it on her. It was her that did it. And you'll see here, she's trying to look nonchalant, like, you know, no big deal or couldn't have been me. And then when she realized that she can't escape uh, the fact that it was her, you can see her now. She pleads and tries to do the cute look to get out of getting trouble uh, with me. Now, uh, the content 
uh, the background uh, for Matthew, and then its uh, beginning content, is the story of Jesus, including large blocks of teaching from the announcement of his birth to the commissioning of the disciples to take the gospel to the whole world. Uh, the author, according to Papias, who, uh, Papias, who was uh, a leader in the church in AD 125, attributes the first gospel to the apostle Matthew, who had been a tax collector. The date, very likely, it was written in the 70s or the 80s AD, which is very important with all the gospels, with the entire New Testament. It, but the Gospels particularly was written during the time that the eyewitnesses to the events were still alive. So they could have refuted what has been written if it was not true, or they could have confirmed what was written because it was true. And then the recipients, almost certainly Jewish Christians with a commitment to the Gentile mission, most commonly thought to have lived in and around Antioch of Syria. And then the emphasis of this book is Jesus is the Son of God, the Messianic King of the Jews. Jesus is God present with us in miraculous power. Jesus is the church's Lord. The teaching of Jesus has continuing importance for God's people. The gospel of the kingdom is for all peoples, Jew and Gentile alike. Uh, King Jesus called Matthew to be his ambassador, and he calls you to be the same. We are the king's ambassadors, the ambassadors of the king. At the end of Matthew's uh, book, he, uh, he writes down what Jesus said just before he went back to heaven. He said in Matthew 28, verse 19, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. Paul writes to the Corinthians and says, so we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. Isaiah 6 verse 8, then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here am I, send me. Uh, Philippians 2 verse 15 then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. Ambassadors of Christ, here am I, send me. Go, he said, around the world and make disciples in all generations, everyone everywhere following Jesus. Uh, last weekend, Kimberly and I celebrated our 40th wedding anniversary uh, up in Big Bear. Uh, by the way, while we were up there, I said to her, you know, I've got a copy of the Green Bay Packers schedule, and I need to put each of their 17 games uh, into my calendar. And she said, oh, I already did that a month ago. And it confirmed yet again that I made the right decision <laughs> to marry her 40 years ago. Uh, it was funny, I was texting during the weekend with uh, Pastor Phil Jackson here within our church family. Uh, Phil and Al Doris, uh, they were celebrating their 44th wedding anniversary this weekend as Kimberly and I were celebrating our, our 40th. And uh, Kimberly was laughing. She said, you can tell the era that Al Doris and Kimberly, they're, they're married in because the bride is wearing a hat. Uh, how many of you brides wore a hat uh, at your wedding. Well, then maybe you were part of the same uh, era. How many of you husbands have no idea if your bride wore a hat or not? Uh, that would be me. Uh, speaking of ambassadors, uh, we were also um, reminiscing about the uh, best man in, in our wedding, my best man, it was John Hanford, my seminary roommate. Uh, he was a United States ambassador for both terms of President George W. Bush. So for both of his terms, uh, my friend John was uh, a United States ambassador. And the funny thing about John is the week of our wedding, he snuck into town early when we didn't even know he was in town, snuck into town early and hid out the entire week in the basement of the Methodist church making a slideshow for the rehearsal dinner. 
Another thing we reminisced about is that Kimberly and I, uh, a couple of nights before the, our wedding, saw the northern lights uh, for the first time, uh, only time in our lives, just a couple of nights before our wedding. And so we tried to recreate that moment when uh, the Perseid meteor shower peaked at 1 a.m. on Sunday. So our 40th anniversary was midnight, and then an hour later was the peak of the Perseid um, uh, meteor shower. Uh, we saw 15 meteors in uh, meteorites in, in 30 minutes. Well, Philippians 2, verse 15, when I was looking at that sky, I thought back to this verse, then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. Can we go back to that picture of the meteorites one more time? This is the picture of you, church, of you, follower of Jesus. You are, uh, Paul says, like a, 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 a bright star in, in the sky. You're, you're going across the sky proclaiming Christ in your generation, in your location, in your family, in your neighborhood, where you work. Uh, back to Philippians 2.15, then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. Right when I was uh, typing this into my notes, I was listening to a Christian song, on, a praise song on Spotify, and it said, you are like shooting stars burning up the night. Uh, let's go back to that picture one more time. This is you, Christ follower. You are like a shooting star burning up the night, an ambassador of the king. Now in Matthew chapter 10, we have instructions for ambassadors during three different time periods. First of all, instructions for past ambassadors. Uh, in Matthew chapter 10, verses 1 through 15, these are the 12 disciples being sent to the nation of Israel. Uh, and then instructions for future ambassadors in uh, Matthew chapter 10, verses 16 through 23. And these are Christian or Jewish believers uh, during the tribulation period right before uh, Christ's return. And then seven instructions for present ambassadors. And that's where we're going to spend the majority, the remainder of our time is the ones that, that are, are for us the present ambassadors in uh, Matthew chapter 10, uh, verses 24 through 42. So let's start with the first one, which is suffering is to be expected. Number one, the first instruction for uh, present ambassadors is that suffering is to be expected. He says in Matthew 10, verse 24, the student is not above the teacher nor a servant above his master. It is enough for students to be like their teachers and servants like their masters. If the head of the house has been called Beelzebub, how much more the members of his household? Uh, if, you, if he's was called Satan, then you will be called Satan. Uh, Beelzebub uh, literally uh, means the Lord of the flies or can mean the Lord of dung. And it is a name for Satan uh, given within the scripture. And so Jesus is saying, if Jesus was called Satan, you will be called Satan as well. Now, let me take a little tangent here uh, to talk about a subtle way that Christians are attacked in our culture. On a regular basis, you will see articles in the media and their headlines will go uh, something like this. Uh, why young people are leaving Christianity? or why older people are leaving Christianity, or why people who live in brick houses are leaving Christianity, or why people born in January are leaving Christianity, and, and so on. Any, any way they can come up with a fresh headline and just say the same material over and over again. And the inference in these articles is that Christians are such bad people and that they believe such stupid things that no wonder people would want to leave us. Now, first of all, it's just not, the whole premise is just not true. Or it's not true in the way that it's portrayed uh, as, as, as being uh, true. Uh, Pastor Eric share, shared with me a book this past week that he's been reading. 
and it's called the myth of the, the dying church. The myth of the dying church, based on very, very uh, solid and upstanding research by Glenn uh, Stanton. And uh, the myth of the, uh, the dying church, the, the subtitle uh, to this is how Christianity is actually thriving in America and the world. And then it, it, it quotes a Harvard and Indiana University study. So a, a joint a study between Harvard University and Indiana University. And it says intense religion in the United States is persistent and exceptional in the ways that do not fit the secularization thesis. Uh, basically, it, it's saying all those headlines are wrong. And the author, Glenn Stanton, presents solid research uh, to support these findings uh, from Harvard and from Indiana University. And here are the four things that this research found. Uh, first of all, biblical churches are holding strong. But number two, theologically progressive churches are hemorrhaging, hemorrhaging that means bleeding out, um, members. This is where the loss is taking place. The loss that's being reported in these other articles, they don't discern between biblical-based churches and theologically uh, progressive churches. Uh, uh, obviously, another fact that is just very well known, it's just been attributed um, all the time, you can, you can find this information, global growth of Christianity is booming. You, you don't think Christianity is having any, any struggles at all if you live in Nairobi or if you're in Seoul, South Korea. Uh, or any of these places in the world, Latin America, Africa, Asia, uh, you, you, you would think South America, Latin America, Africa, Asia, you, you would think that if you were there, oh my goodness, it's just exploding. And then he also found that young adult attendance at biblically faithful churches is at a 50-year high. Now, let me get back to the inference that people leave Christianity because Christians are, are, are bad people. Um, let me just give you an example of how the media focuses on our, the weak side of us, even if it's small, rather than the strong side, attractive side, even though it's large. How many of you watching right now online have ever heard of the Westboro Baptist Church? How many of you have heard of the Westboro Baptist Church? How many people do you think are in the Westboro Baptist Church? You, you want to take a guess based on media attention? 10,000, 20,000, 30,000? Just 32 people are part of the Westboro Baptist Church. These are 32 of the nastiest people on planet Earth. Just three families. It's only 32 people, three families in Topeka, Kansas. Uh, you would have thought it was humongous based on the media attention they get. Let me ask you another question. How many of you have heard of the Yoda, Yodo, a full gospel church? Have you ever heard of that? Well, that is a church of 800,000 Christians, 830,000 Christians in South Korea who are known for their care for the poor in their surrounding area. Now, why does almost everybody in America know about the Westboro Earl Baptist Church and almost nobody knows about the Yodo Full Gospel Church? I think you know the answer. Now, let me talk out of both sides of my mouth uh, with regard to this uh, image that's uh, bad people in the church that are driving people away from Christianity. Uh, let me talk out of both sides of my mouth. Uh, first side, we must do everything possible to not be a stumbling block or a hindrance to those who would follow Christ. Everything possible. When a person is seeking Christ or has just come to Christ, Satan's strategy is to help them meet the most obnoxious Christian possible as soon as possible. That's his mission. And all of his demons uh, have him meet the most obnoxious Christian possible as soon as possible. We need to do everything we can to not be that guy or that girl. 
Let's, let's not make it easy for Satan to find that person. Peter put it this way. He said in 1 Peter 4, verse 14, if you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief. By the way, there is a, a tendency in American culture right now to de-emphasize robbery or theft, to make it not that big of a deal, to kind of say, oh, well, you know, people will steal and people will rob and it's not that big of a deal. Uh, let me just point out that Peter, and you see this pattern throughout the scripture, all through uh, the, the scripture, murderer and thief are put side by side in scripture. Uh, if you suffer, it should not be as a murderer, or thief, or any other kind of criminal, or even as a meddler. A meddler. We're going to come back to that word in a moment. However, if you, if you, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. Now, the, the word translated in the earlier verse, meddler, is alatria piscopus. And it is a rare word. As a matter of fact, some Bible scholars believe that it may have been a mishmash word that Peter just kind of made up on the spot. And, and, and it's very difficult to translate it, but it's something along the idea of, of a meddler. And I like to think that Peter is saying, you know, don't, don't be known as, uh, don't be, if you think you suffer because you're a murderer or suffer because you're a thief, don't say, oh my goodness, I'm being persecuted for following Christ. He said, or even if you are a uh, alatri episcopus, uh, e even if you are just, uh, I think, a jerk is what he's saying. He's basically saying a meddler, annoying, obnoxious, a jerk. He says, avoid all those things uh, in order to not give a bad reputation to followers of Christ and to turn off people that are either seeking after Christ or have just begun to follow him. Uh, Jesus put it even stronger in Matthew 18, verse 6. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea uh, than to make someone stumble in following after Jesus. Um, just to make sure that in no way are, are, are we giving unnecessary offense to the gospel? Let the offense be Jesus. Let it not be, let it not be us. Now, let me talk out the other side of my mouth. As followers of Christ, we need to do everything we can to make sure that we have not given Satan ammunition to work with to cause ourselves to be a stumbling block to keep somebody from following Jesus, to stop them from following Jesus, or to prevent them from continuing to follow Jesus. But now let me talk out the other side of my mouth. It is not a valid excuse for a person to say that they reject Christ because they encountered a Christian who was a jerk, uh, a meddler. Um, what was that word that Peter used? Alatria Piscopus. Uh, it, it, that is not going to be a valid excuse on Judgment Day. When you stand before God someday, it will not work to say, well, I didn't follow you because someone was mean to me at church. Or I didn't follow you because of the Crusades back in 1095 AD. That, that is not going to cut it. God will say in response, some of my kids are idiots. Tell me something I didn't know. <laughs> Some of my kids are idiots. Tell me something I, I didn't know. That will not be an excuse uh, on that day. And don't allow it to be an excuse for following Jesus. Jesus is perfect. Those that are forgiven and follow him are imperfect. As a matter of fact, Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7, uh, he says, but we have this treasure, the treasure of the gospel, 
the perfection of the gospel of Christ in jars of clay. When followers of Christ who are forgiven but not perfect, when they share the treasure of the gospel, they are sharing it in a jar of clay to show, there, there's a purpose behind this, that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. And here now is why the vast majority of people either reject the Christian faith or leave the Christian faith. It is not because of, of mean or obnoxious Christians. Here, here's here's the, the vast majority, the primary reason. Matthew 24, verse 12. Uh, Jesus uh, said, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. Why do people fall away, fall away from following Christ? The increase of wickedness. Let's go back to that verse. Why, why do people, most people reject Christ? Uh, the narrow path, choose the broad road over the narrow road. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. When wickedness increases, the love of other people grows cold and the love of God grows cold. Verse 13, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations and then the end will come. Uh, Theodore Beza, who was the successor to John Calvin in his church, he said, let it be your pleasure to remember that the church is an anvil which has worn out many a hammer. The church is an anvil which has worn out many a hammer. Number two, God will bring everything to light. Uh, chapter 10, verse 26, so do not be afraid of them for there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. The flat rooftops of Palestinian houses provided excellent places uh, for speakers. Number three, we fear God alone. Verse 28, uh, Jesus said, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who, the one capital O, God, capital O-N-E, who can destroy both soul and body in hell. That's the one to truly uh, be afraid of. The worst that they can do does not match the worst that God can do. We have so many fears, and we're adding new ones every day. It seems like every day there's a story in the news that gives you something new to be afraid of. Did you see the one recently about Peggy Jones? Uh, a woman in Beaumont, Texas, who was out riding her riding lawnmower, mowing the grass, and a snake fell on her from the sky that a hawk had been carrying. The snake wraps itself around her arm and begins to strike at her eyes. The hawk then attacks her to get his snake back. The hawk grabs the snake and flies away. She is covered in blood, but she survives. Something new to be afraid of. Snakes falling from the sky. You know, we have so many fears. And we add new ones to the list every day. Why don't we simplify it down to one fear? The fear of God. Warren Wearsby writes, The fear of God is the fear that cancels fear. The fear of God, having that one fear in our life, that's the fear that cancels all other fears. And then number four, God cares for his own. Verse 29, Jesus continues, are not two sparrows sold for a penny, yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid, you are worth more than many sparrows. God cares about what happens to his ambassadors. If you're an ambassador of the king, the king cares 
about what's happening to you. He sees it. Uh, he'll eventually deal with it. Uh, King David in the Old Testament is an Old Testament picture or a foreshadowing of King Jesus. And in 2 Samuel chapter 10, verses 1 and 7, we see that if you mistreat the king's ambassador, the king will go to war against you. It says in 2 Samuel 10, verse 1, in the course of time, the king of the Ammonites died. And his son Hanan succeeded him as the king. And David thought, I will show kindness to Hanan, son of Nahash, just as his father showed kindness to me. So David sent a delegation. He sent out his ambassadors, a delegation of his ambassadors to express his sympathy to Hanan concerning his father. When David's men came to the land of the Ammonites, the Ammonite commander said to Hanan, their Lord, do you think David is honoring your father by sending envoys to you to express sympathy? Hasn't David sent them to you only to explore the city and spy it out and, and overthrow it? So Hanan sees David's envoys. He attacked, he seized the king's ambassadors, shaved off half of each man's beard, cut off their garments at the buttocks, and sent them away. Now, I, I'm no expert on, on things, all things 1000 BC, but that sounds like the way you disrespect somebody in 1000 uh, BC. When David was told about this, he sent messengers to meet the men, for they were greatly humiliated. The king said, stay at Jericho till your beards have grown and then come back. It says in verse six, when the Ammonites realized that they had become obnoxious to David. When anybody messes with you as an ambassador of King Jesus, the king, that person becomes obnoxious to the king. Anybody messes with you is messing with the king, God sees, and that person becomes obnoxious to them. He realized that he had become obnoxious to David. They said, well, we better prepare to defend ourselves because we know what's coming. They hired 20,000 Aramean foot soldiers from Beth Rehob. And, uh, oh, back, back to that one more time, if you could go back one verse. Uh, and Zobah, as well as the king of Mecca, with 1,000 men and also 12,000 men from Tob. It says in, in verse 7, on hearing this, David sent Joab out with the entire army of fighting men. God will send out an army to defend you. He will send out an army to defend his ambassadors. And then number five, Christ honors those who confess him. Those that swear allegiance to the king are those who are honored by the king. Matthew 10, verse 32 Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. And the number six, Jesus warned us that we cannot escape conflict. Jesus came to bring peace, but that peace only comes to those who place themselves under the authority of the king. There will remain conflict with those who choose not to place themselves under the authority of the king, even within our own family. Uh, verses 34 through 39. Do not suppose that I've come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I've come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Uh, a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Jim Elliott, who was killed for telling people about Jesus, 
And this picture was taken shortly uh, before his death, uh, killed for telling people about Christ, killed because he was an ambassador to the king. He wrote shortly before then, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep in order to gain that which he cannot lose. And then number seven, we can be a blessing to others. Verses 40 through 42. Anyone who welcomes you welcomes me. And anyone who welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet as a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person as a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones who is my disciple, truly I tell you, that person will certainly not lose their reward. What a tremendous privilege and honor and opportunity it is to be the king's ambassadors, to be an ambassador of King Jesus. The Bible says my king is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I wonder do you know him? My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captive. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent and he beautifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's the key to knowledge. He's the wellspring of wisdom. He's the doorway of deliverance. He's the pathway of peace. He's the roadway of righteousness. He's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. I wish I could describe him to you. Yes, he's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. You can't get him out of your mind. You can't, you can't get him off of your hand. You can't outlive him and you can't live without him. Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him. And the grave couldn't hold him. Yeah! That's my king. That's my king. Amen. Hi, everyone. 
My name is Claire, and I am the High School Ministries Associate Pastor here at Purpose Church. And I want to thank you again for joining our online community. Don't forget to visit our website, follow our social media, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And make sure to click the bell icon to receive notifications throughout the week. I hope to see you in person or here online again soon.